Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are talking about the endocrine system. This is the first lecture series, and it's part two. We're going to start talking about the thyroid gland. Thyroid hormone is called levothyroxine, or synthroid. That's the synthetic thyroid hormone that people take if they are hypothyroid. Now, thyroid hormone has receptors in all sorts of different cells, and it increases your basal metabolic rate by up to 100%. So thyroid hormone is involved in your energy use, transcription of enzymes, heart rate, contractility. Lots of different systems in your body respond to thyroid hormone. Typically, a dose of thyroid hormone takes about 6 to 12 hours to work and has a peak effect in about 10 to 12 days. That's assuming the patient continues maintenance therapy, taking the drug every day. If you would give a patient IV thyroid hormone T3, you could get an effect in maybe 72 hours. As you can see, skipping a day or two of thyroid hormone is probably not a big deal. And so we usually don't worry too much about patients taking or not taking their thyroid drugs on the day of surgery. When a patient has too much thyroid hormone, the symptoms are symptoms of sympathetic system, like heart palpitations, tremor, and increased metabolism, like weight loss, increased appetite, and people can have anxiety, confusion, and insomnia. Severe overdose can actually lead to fever, hypoglycemia, heart failure, in which case the treatment is supportive care and beta blockade, and we'll discuss that a little bit more in just a few minutes. When patients are hyperthyroid, we have drugs that can work against the thyroid gland. Those would be propothiouracil, PTU, and methimazole. These drugs inhibit thyroperoxidase, which is an enzyme involved in the formation of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone contains iodine, and that process occurs inside the thyroid gland. Iodine is incorporated into tyrosine residues, and that's what thyroperoxidase is involved with. So these drugs, PTU and methimazole, methimazole, don't actually block the release of formed thyroid hormone. They just block the synthesis of new thyroid hormone. They have a second effect, which is the thyroid hormone that's predominantly released is called T4. And then outside the thyroid gland, T4 gets converted into T3, which is more active and more potent. And it turns out that PTU blocks that conversion of T4 to T3 in the periphery. So these drugs are used to treat chronic hyperthyroidism. They can also be used in a case of acute thyroid storm or thyrotoxicosis. But a limitation is that these drugs are not available in IV formulation. There have been some studies where they've taken the drug and had the pharmacist grind it up dissolve it in liquid and filter it and then give it IV and that has been done but that's probably not a normal and common way of giving the medication. Side effects of propothiouracil and methimazole include rash, agranulocytosis which is a loss of white blood cells, <clears throat> methimazole shouldn't be used in the first trimester of pregnancy and PTU is no longer a first-line agent because of some cases of severe hepatic failure. Now, in patients who have thyroid storm, there are other drugs that can be used. Most importantly, beta blockade. Propranolol or esmolol can be used to prevent these symptoms of hyperthyroidism. Most importantly, the tachycardia and the hypertension, which is often what kills people during an acute thyroid storm. Propranolol also does that same blockade of T4 to T3 conversion in the periphery, whereas esmolol does not. And so really, antithyroid medications like PTU or methimazole are second-line treatments for thyroid storm because, as we saw, their onset of action is a little bit slower. So they have a role, but the first role is really beta blockade to control hemodynamics. Other drugs that can be used are iodides, which basically work in a negative feedback mechanism to inhibit release of thyroid hormone. Sometimes people use them chronically as well. Steroids have been used to block peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. 
And don't forget acetaminophen, which can be used in order to control hyperthermia during thyroid storm. We'll stop here. If you have any questions about the thyroid gland, you can let me know and we can discuss them. Now we're going to move on to obstetric endocrinology. I just want to quickly discuss oral contraceptive pills, which usually contain estrogen or an estrogen-progesterone progesterone combination. Estrogen is probably the component that's responsible for most of the side effects. And all I think we really need to know about these medications, which are very prevalent in our patient populations, is that there is some risk of thromboembolism, of getting a blood clot, which could lead to a heart attack or a stroke as well. And we especially see this in women who are older than age 35 and who are smokers. So when you have those two factors together with oral contraceptives, I suppose I would be more vigilant that we are taking precautions for DVT prophylaxis in the operating room. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about a series of drugs that you may find when you're working in the labor and delivery uh, suite. The first is oxytocin, also called pitocin. This drug is used to induce labor and it can also increase the tonicity of the uterus. It can make it uh, the, the uterine muscle uh, firm up in the postpartum period. You can start it at one to two milliunits per minute and titrate it to contractions if you're trying to induce labor. And at our institution, we have a standard protocol for running Pitocin in order to prevent uterine atony, uterine flaccidness. We give a bolus of 600 milliunits per minute over 30 minutes, and then we run an infusion at 18 units. Uh, I apologize. That, that's a total of 18 units given over 30 minutes. And then we run an infusion at 60 milliunits per minute. Side effects of Pitocin include hypotension, flushing, tachycardia, and nausea, which we see quite a bit of. So you may see patients being given this drug to accelerate labor, it's, standard, it's a standard drug given to patients after delivery, especially after C-section, in order to make the uterine wall firm and to stop uterine bleeding. And you may want to have Pitocin on hand even in non-labor and delivery settings. For example, a DNC um, done for a fetal loss or a miscarriage, or perhaps even for a DNC for other types of uterine bleeding. The next drug we're going to talk about is methergen. Methergen is an ergot derivative which causes uterine blood vessels to constrict and uterine muscle to contract, which again closes down those blood vessels. It's also used to control bleeding after childbirth or abortion. And it's actually been used to help expel retained products after a missed abortion or a miscarriage. It's administered as a point two milligram intramuscular dose and its side effects include hypertension and pulmonary hypertension and so therefore you must know that methogen is contraindicated in patients who have severe preeclampsia because those patients typically have hypertension the other similar drug that you should know about is hemabate Hemabate is related to prostaglandins, and it also causes uterine contractions and reduces bleeding, and can be used to trigger an abortion. The drug is given 250 micrograms, again intramuscular, and its most notable side effect is bronchoconstriction. And so you must know that hemabate should not be given to patients who have severe asthma. The last drug I want to discuss is magnesium sulfate. There are many places throughout our curriculum where magnesium would fit in, but I've decided to put it here because one common use of magnesium is to prevent seizures in patients who have preeclampsia and to control seizures in patients with eclampsia. Preeclampsia is a condition where 
pregnant women become hypertensive, spill protein into their urine, and in its more severe stages, they can have cerebral or visual disturbances, pulmonary edema, decreased platelet counts, abdominal pain, and liver dysfunction. And this can progress to eclampsia, which is actual seizures. So by stabilizing excitable membranes, magnesium sulfate is the treatment of choice to prevent and control seizures during eclampsia and preeclampsia. There are other uses for magnesium sulfate. It is a relaxant of smooth and skeletal muscles by inhibiting release of acetylcholine as well as acting on the motor end plate. So this can cause vasodilation, which can make for some sweating and flushing, but actually will lower blood pressure at higher doses. It's been used as a tocolytic, which means a drug to stop premature labor. And as a result of this muscle relaxation, you will see deep tendon reflexes start to disappear at serum levels above 4 milligrams per deciliter, which is about double the normal serum level of magnesium. Patients who are on a magnesium infusion need to be monitored closely, and one of the things they check is reflexes to make sure that they have not lost their reflexes completely, which might be an early sign of overdose. Magnesium sulfate also slows down the SA node and prolongs conduction time in the heart and is used as a treatment for torsade de point, usually a 1 to 2 gram slow IV bolus. Of course, magnesium sulfate is also used as a supplement for patients who have hypomagnesemia. In OB, the loading dose is typically 4 to 6 grams IV over 10 to 15 minutes followed by an infusion at 1 to 3 grams per hour. And in addition to clinical monitoring of blood pressure, in addition to clinical monitoring of blood pressure and deep tendon reflexes and mental status, serum magnesium levels can also be sent, shooting for a level of 4 to 6 milligrams per deciliter and at all costs staying below 8 when we're starting to get close to toxicity. Magnesium is cleared by the kidneys and so renal disease is a contraindication, or at least a severe caution. We also should not give magnesium treatments to patients who have myasthenia gravis or other neuromuscular diseases, patients with heart block or recent myocardial infarction. Signs of magnesium overdose include hypotension, absent reflexes, weakness, depression of the CNS, potentiation of neuromuscular blockade, and progressing to respiratory arrest. The treatment of magnesium sulfate overdose is calcium gluconate. And that's it for this installment of endocrine medications. In the next set of lectures, we'll discuss additional endocrine drugs, and we'll see you then.